Oh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> uh, this morning, I want to I want to talk about. Uh, a lot, well, last week we we did uh, the sermon on Ezekiel thirty-seven and the Valley of the Dry Bones, and uh, I had a few people email me asking me about the Valley of the Dry Bones in relation to the resurrection of the dead, the final resurrection of the dead. Because many people think that's what it's speaking about, because it's obvious, that's, it's very figurative. But it is a very figurative passage. It's not talking about the literal resurrection of the dead, although there is some correlations to it, there's some uh, shadowing to it. But uh, the figurative language in that passage, in that vision, tells us that's not what it's talking about, because it talks about how the event that happened happened around the time of the forgiveness of sins and iniquities, which would have been at the cross, around the cross. So that would give us a hint to when that is. It's also talking about the whole house of Israel. And, uh, and it talks about the Spirit of God coming into them. And it's a very figurative passage. It's not talking about the literal resurrection of the dead, although in many publications and books that those passages are quoted because it's a very vivid picture and um, but there's many many passages in the Old Testament and New Testament about it and uh, I put together what I'm calling an overview of the resurrection of the dead um, because I mean, we could do several several studies uh, on the topic because it's very extensive in Scripture and, uh, and I may at some other time, either here or maybe on a radio broadcast, but I wanted to go over it because within the Bible and Christianity, it, this is a core central doctrine. I mean, this isn't a small doctrine. It's uh, very, very big, and it is very important. Uh, it's really, it's one of the core doctrines of Christianity that when you remove it, you end up with something else. Um, so it's a wonderful promise, you know, that... After we die, us as believers will be resurrected unto life again at some time in the future. And that shouldn't be downplayed. It shouldn't be overlooked. It shouldn't be... Uh, it should be talked about more. Honestly, there isn't enough messages about it. I wanted to read uh, a definition by Noah Webster of uh, what the resurrection was. I thought it was a very brief but good definition in his 1828 dictionary. It says this, Quote, a rising again, chiefly the revival of the dead of the human race or their return from the grave, particularly at the general judgment. By the resurrection of Christ, we have assurance of the future resurrection of men. 1 Peter 1, 3. Now, although very brief, I think Noah Webster did a pretty good job of just summing it up as brief as you could. You know, that's what the resurrection is. There's an expectation in Scripture of the resurrection and what it is, and um, it's, it's pretty... And we have a lot of examples of it. It's pretty clear. You know, we have the examples of Lazarus, we have the examples of uh, Tabitha, and so forth, many others that we'll go over, that give us an, an idea, a view of what the res resurrection will look like. Now, the problem we run into is within a lot of different sects in Christianity and outside of Christianity, you end up with views that don't even resemble this. You end up with a spiritual view of the resurrection, which is odd because we have so many different examples of what, what a resurrection looks like, like Lazarus, for example, Jesus, physical resurrection, you know, body coming back, um, it's kind of odd that then you go and change that and then switch it up to something spiritual or figurative. Um, another issue that with this doctrine, core doctrine, is a lot of people don't believe in the resurrection. A lot of people, Christians, that claim to be Christian, they don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they believe when someone dies, they go to heaven and sit on a cloud. Some of them teach that you go to a waiting room called purgatory. Um, and others say that you go immediately to hell and burn and punishment. Others say that you're like a ghost and you float around the earth. Um, all of which, and it's often pointed out, all of which are not death. Cessation from life is what death is. So all those are other forms of life. Um, it's ascending to a higher plane of existence is uh, something you could say. Um, when you turn from a, a, a body to some kind of ghost or spirit, it's still life. It, you're still living. You are still in some kind of living existence. So none of those are death. 
So in order for there to be a resurrection of the dead, dead you have to have someone has to be dead, like Lazarus. Uh, he was dead. Um, and that's what makes the resurrection so amazing, is the fact that you can take something that was once dead and God, through the power of God, brings it back to life, brings that person back to life. That's, that's the amazing part of it. And it's often um, torn down when you, you start putting different people in different planes of existence, whether it be a ghost or in purgatory or whatever. So I wanted to look at a few examples of how the dead are described in the scriptures as being silenced, being in uh, somewhere that you can't praise the Lord, somewhere you know they know nothing. Basically, that they're they're gone, they're dead, and that is hard for some people to take a hold of and grasp because of tradition. But it's amazing when we understand the promise of the resurrection. So I wanted to go to Psalms chapter 115, verse 17. And it says here, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So this would indicate that up in heaven, if they're up in heaven, there's no praising the Lord. That's kind of a dark image. You know, I would think they'd be praising. The Britain Septuagint renders this verse 17 and 18 as this. The dead shall not praise thee, O Lord, nor any that go down unto Hades, but we, the living, will bless the Lord from hence and forever. Another verse is a Psalm 146, verse 4, which says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Another one is Job 14:14. 14, 14. This is the King James. It says, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Now, this verse in the Brenton Septuagint is really interesting because uh, it, it gives a different light on it a little bit. Not too much of a light. Uh, it just changes that till my change come part. Um, and I think it sheds more of a light on the Septuag in the Septuagint on the resurrection, the the promise of the resurrection, says this, For if a man should die, he shall live again, having accomplished the days of his life, question mark. I will wait till I exist again. So here, Job has an expectation that he will exist again. He will die and then he will e exist sometime in the future. But when he's dead, he's dead. He knows that. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says this, For the living know that they shall die. Which is pretty clear. We all know we're going to die. But the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, I don't know if that's speaking of the memory of the person or the memory of the person that they hold. You know, when they, when they die, they, their memory's gone. They, they cease. They don't know anything. Now let's drop down to verse 10 in that same chapter in Ecclesiastes. It says here, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Now this is an encouraging passage for us in the here and now, because what it says is whatever we're doing now, we need to do it with all our might. Um, that is a teaching of work ethic for one, um, whatever we find ourselves doing, you know, whether it be plowing a field or our work or, or the work for the Lord or whatever, we need to do it with all our might. And the point here in the passage is, is when we die, that work's done with. So we need to make the most of the time we have. Um, because we don't know when our time is in. When our time is ended, it's over. There is no, as it says here, therefore there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. That's pretty plain and clear and cut and dry. So we need to make the most of our life is the encouraging part there. Isaiah 38, 18 through 19 says this. Isaiah 38, 18 through 19. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. 
The father to the children shall make known thy truth. His point here, Isaiah, is that while you're alive, we can praise the Lord, we can work for the Lord, we can do work as the Lord intended, but once we die, we can't. Uh, basically, that's the end of our time here that God's given us. So we need to make the best of it. Um, you know, despite of what um, Catholicism teaches and a lot of other different denominations, we are not created immortal. A lot of people teach that we are immortal from creation. Some people teach reincarnation, that we just go into different forms of life. Afterwards, there's some religions that teach we go back into animals after we die. Uh, even people that claim to be Christian teach stuff like that. It's just nonsense. Uh, if you remember, as you, as you all know, the, the Indians, the Hindus, they teach you come back as a cow. Um, and uh, I've heard of other people talking about how their dead relatives come back as butterflies and bugs and things of that nature. That's heathen, pagan thought. And um, we are not created immortal. I mean, in fact, that's really what makes us us, is that we are mortal. We, we have a time here, and then when it's over, it's over. And the only thing that we have to, to hold on to is the promise that God gave us of the resurrection. Uh, which is solely in His power to do. We don't resurrect ourselves. We don't create ourselves back into a body like Jesus did. We don't, we don't do that. To prove that point, uh, how, that Jesus is the only immortal, is um, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 through 16 concerning the immortality of Jesus. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 16, excuse me, 6, Verse 15 through 16. It says here, Which in his time he shall show, who is blessed and only potentate, the Lord, excuse me, the King of kings and Lord of lords, only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, I make all those points just to show and demonstrate in order for there to be a, a resurrection, someone has to die, and we have to die. And uh, as I think it says in Romans, you know, it's appointed once for a man to die, and then the judgment. So we are appointed to die. I want to read a quote here from William Tyndale. Um, he said this in 1830. He was rebutting a man by the name Thomas More. On this subject, this exact subject of the immortality of the soul and whether or not, um, you know, a person dies or not. And I say soul, the word soul is confusing too, and I've talked about it before. It just means living. It just means you're alive. Uh, in Genesis, when it says uh, God made Adam a living soul and he breathed in the breath of life, it just said it made him a living being because he was made and he was dead. He was just a dead body. And then he had to have the breath of life breathed into him. This is what William Tyndale said to Thomas More. Quote, "...in ye putting them, the dead, in heaven, hell, and purgatory, destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection. And again, if the souls be in heaven, tell me why they be not in as good case as the angels be." And then, what cause is there of a resurrection? So he's saying, okay, if they're, if they're not dead, then what purpose is there for a resurrection? And within Judeo-Christianity, they have the dead going up to heaven or hell or purgatory, and then coming back in a resurrection, and then going back up or down, and it's, it's really all over the place. Uh, there's no point to it. The resurrection of the dead, the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, just, just doesn't seem that central and important when you do away with the dead. And, and Tyndale's correct. He, you know, if you do away with the dead, there is no need for a resurrection. You tear down the arguments that Paul and Jesus made concerning the resurrection. It just doesn't mean anything. So let's look at some passages of some passages Tyndale would have been thinking about when he was making this, this argument to Thomas More. Uh, when he would have been thinking about passages that would have been completely unrelevant uh, that Jesus and Paul would have said. Let's start in John chapter 11, verse 11 through 14, uh, which is right after the death of Lazarus. And it says here in verse 11, 
These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How about Jesus spake of his death? But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And we'll stop there for a second. In this passage, Jesus is referring to death as a sleep. This is an idiom all throughout the Bible, uh, all the way starting way back in Genesis. Um, it's an idiom that's used. Um, and it's a very obvious why it's an idiom that is used. When you're asleep, or when you're dead, you look like you're asleep. Your eyes are shut, you're, you're you know, you're sleeping. And the fact that that idiom is used is proof of a thought of the resurrection. Because when you are asleep, there is an anticipation that you will be awoken at some point in the future. I mean, that is. Um, so, even way back in Genesis, when they are sleeping, they're dead, there is an anticipation there of some kind of awakening. Let's look now in the same chapter, in verse 22 through 27 of the same chapter, where it says this, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. And this is Martha speaking. And Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, or Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come unto the world. Now we won't read the rest of the passage because we know what happens. He calls Lazarus out of the grave. He wakes him up. But the point I want to point out here is Martha anticipated a resurrection of the dead sometime in the future at the last day. Now, that's very significant. I mean, she anticipated it. She knew it. Uh, she had been taught about it. And um, she understood it. She understood that her brother was going to be resurrected at some time in the future, but she wasn't worried about that. She was worried about the here and now. And Jesus used this this opportunity to teach her and everyone else, you know, a lesson about how He is the resurrection and He is the life. It, through Him, that resurrection is possible. And uh, it doesn't say that he, he, he took Lazarus out of purgatory or heaven or hell and brought him back. Um, you know, if you think that, it's kind of odd, you know. I mean, heaven, compared to where Lazarus is, would be quite pleasurable, I would imagine. For him to bring him back, that it's just very odd to think that. Uh, but if he was dead, that makes the miracle even more amazing because, you know, this body was dead. Lazarus was gone. And then Jesus brought him back from nothing to something. He took a lifeless body and made it live again. That's, that's amazing. That is something man cannot do. We can't even fathom that, can't comprehend that, even though all the scientists in the world would love to do that in their mind. So they could be God, they can't. They can't. They can't make something dead alive. They can't even take dirt and make it, <laughs> uh, make it alive. You know, I remember the, the joke about how, uh, you know, the, the scientists challenged God and they go to a, uh, a contest of how, you know, God's going to make a human and then uh, make a man. And then the scientist said, well, I'll make a man too and we'll see which one's better. And the scientist goes and gets a, a bucket of dirt and God says, oh, no, you can't do that. That's my dirt. Go get your own dirt. Um, you know, we can't even think about creating life. Even though the a a atheist scientists think they can, they can't. Now let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. Jesus uh, spoke about the rising of the dead on the last day here, which should prove that there is more than one last day in Scripture. It says here, Jesus speaking, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which He hath given me, I should lose nothing. So, not going to lose nothing. 
but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. So this raising up... There's many last days in Scripture, but this raising up happens at the last day. Um, this is very significant because he says here, anyone that seeth the Son and believeth on Him, he should have everlasting life. Now this kind of, this kind of diffuses the, the argument that uh, every single Israelite, no matter what they do, will be saved because not all Israelites believeth on the Son. Now, if you say all Israel is saved somehow, some way, every single one, no matter how bad they are, no matter what they do, whatever they believe, uh, which some people teach, um, they, you know, they never believed on the Son, so they have everlasting life. What is Jesus talking about here? Why didn't He say, well, as long as you're born an Israelite, you are saved and you, are, you will have everlasting life? That's not what He says. So... To say that every single Israelite has salvation, they're going to get through the idiot hole in the end, um, is to call Jesus a liar, because He said that only those who believeth on Him will have everlasting life. And He'll raise Him up on the last day. So look at John chapter 5, verse 26 through 29. Jesus said these words concerning the resurrection. For as the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given to the Son to have life in Himself, and hath given Him authority to execute judgment also, because He is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto our, the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So all are going to come forth out of the grave, but some will have life and some will have judgment. That's what the word damnation means. So we're going to have the just and the unjust being raised, but not all of them are going to have eternal life. Now, if you put them in purgatory or a burning hell to be regenerated over and over, they have eternal life. It may not be good life, but it's eternal life. Uh, they're not truly dead, uh, which is an issue there. Now, they'll have judgment, but to say that they're going to be regenerated over and over for eternity is to say they will have eternal life. And Jesus said, only those who believeth on Him will have eternal life. Now, we'll read about it here in a minute, but Revelation talks about the second death, which would include these people that have judgment. So there will be death for them. They will be brought back, judged, and then have a second death after that. Um, that is significant, often something that is not even pointed out. Now let's look at, again, Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Jesus speaks of the resurrection and judgment again. And these shall go away unto everlasting punishment, speaking of the evil, the bad people, but the righteous unto eternal life. There we have that eternal life again. So there will be judgment for the bad, Everlasting punishment is what it says. Now, if you're dead forever, if you go out of existence, that is an everlasting punishment. You are gone. There's no hope for you to come back again. Um, if you have life, you have eternal life. 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to turn there, verse 8 through 9, it does speak of a flame. You know, people want to talk about hell, fire, and brimstone, and the flames. Uh, it says a flame, but it says a flame that is going to bring everlasting destruction. Now, if you're in a flame forever and you're being regenerated forever and ever and ever, that's not everlasting destruction. Maybe everlasting torture, but it's not everlasting destruction. It says here, "...in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of God." of His power. So everlasting destruction, meaning you'll be gone forever and you, you, know, you won't exist anymore. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's see what Paul had to say about the resurrection. Some things that maybe Tyndale would have been thinking about when he said what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to read verse uh, 
uh, 12 through 26. It says here, Now if Christ be pre preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, for if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? Is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then ye also which are fallen asleep, speaking of death, in Christ are perished. They're gone. Because there's no hope if Christ hadn't raised. That's his point. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, and when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So, what he's saying here is if Christ didn't raise, rise from the dead, we have no hope. He, we're most miserable because we have no hope. And it says here, those that have fallen asleep already, they're perished. They're gone. They're like a, you know, something that has perished in the refrigerator. It's gone. It's no longer usable. Nothing, nothing left. But because of Christ, we have that promise. And He was the first fruits of that resurrection. He's the first one. Now, the end being spoken about here obviously is not 70 A.D. Now, a lot of people will try to do that and spiritualize this. Uh, those who hold the full preterist view that everything was fulfilled by 70 A.D. And in order to do that, they have to now make the dead immediately rapture, many raptures, all at one time upon death to heaven or hell or whatever it may be. Um, to do that, you really have a lot of issues. Um, you know, theologically. You know, it says that we'll, He'll raise us up on the last day, whatever that last day is in Scripture. Uh, said that in John chapter 5 and 6. Um, you know, if, if that didn't happen yet, then it's understandable. It didn't happen yet. But if it already happened, then we, He either forgot us, that we're not included, which doesn't make any sense. Or we have to squeeze in this theology of a bunch of mini raptures up to heaven or hell or whatever upon our death, which can't be proven in Scripture. The Scripture gives us an expectation and a promise of a resurrection. And this Scripture here, you know, it says here, Then cometh the end, and when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even... The Father, when He shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for He must reign, so He's reigning currently, when Paul's saying this, till He hath put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, this isn't to say He's not currently reigning right now. In fact, He is. It says He is right here. He must reign till this happens. Now, we see death. It's obvious. So therefore, that enemy is still here. Therefore, the end being spoken about here is still here. If you spiritualize this, it just makes the Scriptures just kind of like a gotcha, you know. That's not really what I meant. I meant the other death. Even though in this passage here, we're talking about, it says here, For since by man, Adam, came death. Did physical death come from Adam? Yes. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. So the expectation there is the death that Adam gave. So there, that's the death we're speaking about, not a spiritual death. And then the promise is what? Re spiritual resurrection? No, that's not what it's speaking about. It's speaking about the death that came through Adam, which was physical death. 
Let's drop down in the same passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's continue reading where Paul was speaking about how the dead rising in a twinkling of an eye and being changed. This didn't happen in 70 AD. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, I want to stop there at incorruptible for just a second. Was Adam made incorruptible in the garden? He began to die. He died. He started dying that day. That's what it says. Now, was it a spiritual death? Yes, it was in a way, but it was also physical death. So it says here when we're reading this, it's saying in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the last day, whatever, whenever that is, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead, physical dead, that's the expectation here, shall be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Speaking of death being the final enemy. Now, if we spiritualize all this, we have to wonder. So this is speaking about spiritual resurrection. So, us, when, which we do. We have a spiritual regeneration, a spiritual resurrection in our lives when we become Christian, born again. Now, if that's what this is speaking about, then what about the afterlife? Can't have them both. Let's say it's speaking about spiritual resurrection. Okay, what about physical resurrection? Well, you can't go back and forth. It's got to be one or the other. Now, many who hold full preterism, they spiritualize everything. But... They have to fill in the blanks with what I call spiritual duct tape or spiritual bondo in the Scripture where they say, well, let's just spiritualize that because I don't understand it. It doesn't fit. Uh, that is inserting things into the Scripture. Um, there is an expectation in, all throughout the Bible of what a resurrection looks like. We have Lazarus. We have Elijah resurrecting the dead child in 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, Jesus resurrecting the daughter in Luke chapter 8. These were all physical resurrections. Um, at Jesus' death in Ma uh, Matthew chapter 18 or 28, we have the saints there in Jerusalem. Another miracle coming up out of the grave. People that they probably knew coming up, I don't know how long they've been dead, but they came up out of the grave there, the graveyard in Jerusalem. That's what I mentioned one time in Scripture, but that was a miracle where a dead person, a, a dead body, came alive. So that expectation is there. Tabitha in um, Peter. Peter rose Tabitha uh, in the book of Acts. That was a dead person brought back to life. That's that expectation. And then the biggest one of all is Jesus. A physical body laid in the grave for three days. Expectation, physical body, and then brought back to life. Now, there's some people that deny it was a, spirit, uh, a physical body, and they say it was a spiritual one, which is false. You know, if you remember, Thomas was told that he could touch Christ, touch the wound. And if he was a ghost, you know, he'd just go right through him. Uh, Gnosticism in the first and second century, they taught that all matter, all body, all flesh was evil. So that was promoted among Gnostics that Christ wasn't, he couldn't be flesh, he couldn't be uh, physical because all things are evil that are flesh. So they had to create this spiritual ghost thing where Jesus resurrected as a ghost. So when you see that in Judeo Christianity today, because some people do teach that Jesus didn't rise physically, that's Gnosticism from the first and second century because they thought all flesh and uh, physical matter was evil. Uh, so we need to reject that. Um, the Bible teaches in physical resurrection. The reformer uh, Martin Luther, uh, he, in writing on a passage in uh, excuse me, uh, in writing on a passage in Ecclesiastes, one we read earlier, Ecclesiastes nine, he said this concerning that passage. It says here, 
Solomon judges the, that the dead are asleep, and sleep nothing at all, excuse me, and feel nothing at all. For the dead lie there, accompanying, excuse me, old English. Uh, for the dead lie there, contemplating nothing, excuse me, for the dead lie there, compting neither days nor years, but when they are awoken, they shall seem to have slept scarce one minute. End quote. Now what Martin Luther's saying is when someone dies, as far as they're concerned, no time will have passed from the time they shut their eyes to the resurrection. Now think about it. If you are gone, dead, the very next thing you will remember, very next memory, as far as you're concerned, it, 10,000 years may have passed, but the very next thing you will remember is coming up out of the grave. Think about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They died thousands of years ago, but the very next thing they will remember is coming up out of the grave. It will be like uh, seconds, milliseconds past. It will be like going to sleep and then waking up in a dreamless sleep the very next moment. That's what Martin, Lu Martin Luther is saying. If you sleep, that is, that's what happens. Um, and that would mean, and I agree with him, and I've... That, to me, is very encouraging, too, because a lot of people don't like this because, oh, you're teaching soul sleep. Well, that's what the Bible talks about, and if you want to call it that, I don't know. Uh, it's up to you. But think about it. The very moment a person dies, they will be at the resurrection immediately, as far as they're concerned, no matter how much time has passed here. So that means, now think about that from our perspective. That means no matter, let's say we live till we're 80 or 60 or 40 or whatever, no matter when we die, that we're there immediately. And everyone that has already left, uh, they will be there immediately. That will be the very next memory. So you think you take that in perspective with all the passages we read in Psalms and, and uh about in uh, Ecclesiastes and Isaiah about you know making the most of the time we have here, that puts that into a bigger perspective because I know everyone's like, well, when's Jesus going to come back? Well, He will come back for us whenever we die. We will be there when we die. It may be tomorrow. It may be when we're 60, 70 years old. Um, we don't know. But as far as we're concerned, our time will end. We will be there when we die, whenever that is. And um, to me, that's encouraging because, you know, everyone's always, like I said, worried about when the end will come. When's Jesus going to come back and fix anything? For us, it is when, when we die. That's when it will happen, as far as we are. Now, I find that amazing because when we die, when our body is there, incorruptible, God knows how to put us back together. He knows our memories. He knows our personalities. Uh, that's stored in God, if you think about it. He, his mind, whatever that is, He remembers how to put us back together. What we are when we die is stored in God in that sense because He remembers how to put us back together. Data. Say what? It's data. It's data, yeah. We're stored in the computer of God, I guess you could say. He knows how to put us back together. All the scientists in the world don't know. All the preachers in the world don't know how to put a person back together. All, whoever. All the people in the world don't know, but one person does. One, one God. Now, the only one God. He knows how to put that person back together exactly the way He wanted them to. He knows their memories. So in a sense, when we die, we're with God in that. And I think that's a lot when it says that uh, when, we, uh, when we die, we're in the presence of the Lord. Well, we are in the presence of the Lord, whether it be at the resurrection immediately after death, or when we are remembered by God when He remembers to put us back together. So I want to close with Revelation chapter 20. If you want to go ahead and turn there. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to read verse 11 through 15. It says here. Because this is what is going to happen when we die. This will be what we remember. Because I think this is in the future. Some people try to say this is in the past. I don't think how they can do that. Um, it says here, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from those whose faces, face the earth and heaven fled away. 
And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And the dead, the death and hell, the death and the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their work. And death and hell, death and the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, the book of eternal life, was cast into the lake of fire. Now notice that death in the grave, we all know what that is. We all understand what that is. There's nothing symbolic there. It's the death and the grave. You know, it talks about the dead rising. It talks about even the people that were, died at sea rising. Um, that's a vivid image, but that means even God knows how to put a person back together when they've been eaten by fish and turned to dust a long time ago, because that's what happens when you die at sea. Um, some people talk about cremation, how um, there's a lot of people that teach against cremation. Now, I don't particularly like it. I think you, know, you should be buried in the ground. But uh, some people teach that when you're cremated, God doesn't know how to put you back together. That's insane, because we all turn to dust <laughs> uh, in one way or form, whether it's accelerated or not, by a fire or by being eaten by a fish. God still knows how to put you back together. So I'm pretty sure God can handle a grandmother or grandfather on, in an urn or put out in the pasture or whatever. Uh, so that's nonsense when people say that. Uh, it's just It's silly. It's silly. Um, but notice that death and the grave are cast into the lake of fire. They're cast in there. And it says this is, there's, it explains it, this is the second death. So those who don't make the cut, those who don't, are not written in the book of life, they are, along with death and the grave, cast into the lake of fire. It doesn't say they're regenerated forever. It says it is the second death. Death being a cessation of life, ceasing. So it is saying these people were brought back, the just and the unjust, and the unjust who didn't make the cut, who are not written in the book of life, they will cease along with the last enemy, death and the grave. Simple as that. And that is a promise that Christians have held to our entire existence. This is a core Christian belief. And when people teach against it, when they teach nonsense... It's a core Christian belief that they're doing, and they're doing exactly what Tyndale said they're doing. They're taking all the arguments that Jesus and Paul and everyone else in the Scripture, all the, all the Old Testament prophets that wrote about it, all the promises they held to, they're saying that it doesn't mean anything. And uh, that's a promise that all of us hold to. It's all a promise we can hold to for other people that, we, that have passed. It, it, it's a promise. Even though we die... There's a promise of being resurrected to life again. And that, that's great. That means that this isn't over with. This is just a portion of it. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about what happens a lot about, a lot about what happens after that. We don't know. It will be a good thing, though, if we're counted among those in the book of life. Now, no matter what judgment comes upon those written in the book of life, uh, not written in the book of life, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. So we don't want to be counted among those people. So we have that promise to hold to. Now that's a very brief uh, overview of the resurrection of the dead, but that is something that we hold to, we need to hold to. We don't need to be quiet about it. We need to teach and talk about how we have that promise. It's a very good promise. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for all the things that You've given us, Lord. We thank You for the promises that You've given us, Lord. The promises You gave Paul and the early Christians, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Job, and Isaiah, Ezekiel, Solomon, and David, Lord. We, we, we cling on to the promises that they had and we hold on to today, Lord. We thank You, Lord. We praise You. And we ask You, Lord, to be with us, Lord. Let us do better this upcoming week than we did the last, Lord. Be with our people all across this land, Lord. 
Open our eyes, Lord, to things that we're doing wrong, Lord, and help us do better, Lord, and do the same, Lord, to our brethren all across this land, Lord. And let us be found worthy, Lord, right here and now and at our death, Lord. We praise You and we thank You. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.